Back in 84, Hyundai served up 25,000 of these to Canadians and 50,000 in 85. But this week on Motoring 97, we'll discover Hyundai now has Shark on the menu. TSN's Motoring 97 is brought to you by Quaker State. The Big Q stands for quality, always has, always will, and Midas, the way it should be. So how do you like it? Well, Hyundai is hoping you love it. This is the brand new 1997 Hyundai Tiburon. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 97. Now this car is considered to be a sporty car. But don't the people at Hyundai read the newspapers? I mean, the sports car segment has literally been decimated with such well-known vehicles as the RX-7 and the 300ZX going by the wayside. Well, you know, Hyundai may be 14th in overall car production in the world, so they're hardly trendsetters. What we've discovered out here on the coast of California is that Hyundai, with the Tiburon, is hoping to at least buck a trend. In case you missed it, there's a new car segment to help make your buying experience even more complicated. Build is small and sporty. The segment includes vehicles such as the Pontiac Sunfire, the Saturn, and Nissan's 240SX. Tiburon is Spanish for shark, and Hyundai is hoping to take a large bite out of this segment, as well as boosting its image. As you know, that uh, uh, our uh, corporate image was uh, built as a value-oriented car manufacturer to offer the uh, very the economical price uh, and uh, affordable car. But uh, by this new offering, our first sports coupe, we want to build a new corporate image okay, to offer to our customer the high quality point to drive vehicle. And that's our major goal. The Tiburon's exterior style was based on the HCD2 concept car that was introduced in 1993. Two trim levels will be offered. The base Tiburon features a four-cylinder, inline, double overhead cam, 1.8-liter beta engine with 130 horsepower. The FX that we tested comes equipped with a two-liter, 140 horsepower engine. The interior is well-appointed with dual airbags standard. The base model comes with ventilated front discs and drums on the rear with an optional four-channel ABS. The suspension features McPherson struts on the front and dual-link suspension in the rear that is tuned by Porsche. Prices will range from $16,000 to $21,000. For the price, uh, this vehicle is one of the best handling cars that we ever had. I think it's probably one of the best right now in the, in the, uh, in the segment that we're looking at. And uh, the way the suspension is made is one of, the, I think, the top at the moment. It's a unique uh, situation uh, for us because uh, we have a, a car that's uh, styled uh, to a point where it's uh, going to be very appealing because of the price, uh, the warranty, the, uh, the quality of the car is, uh, is superb, and it'll be probably 8 to 10 percent of our total sales. That amounts to about 1,500 cars annually, and Hyundai believes that Tiburon will attract a new customer to the showroom. Already after we introduced the brand new Elantra sedan, new customer are coming to our dealership already. I believe that by the new addition, uh, we can develop the completely brand new the customer base. Not only is Hyundai hoping to change its image with the customer, but also with its own dealers. Yeah, we produced that video, and that was that production of that was for our dealer network just to get them excited about the car and uh, you know the cars are flying around corners and going through the air and unfortunately I don't think you can show that in a commercial but uh, it's a whole new image for our company that car is going to uh, really excite some people. The dealers are very very anxious to see this car 
um, again, it gives them uh, another segment of the uh, of the market that uh, that they haven't seen for a while, and that's the uh, the sporty car segment. So there's 145 dealers across the country that uh, are uh, really anxious to get their uh, their hands on this car. Next week, Graham Fletcher gets behind the wheel to get his first taste of the new Shark on test drive. That's next week. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the RAV4. For years, Suzuki have had the lone entrant in the compact sport utility market. Well, times are a-changing, as they say. Not only will Honda have the CRV, but Toyota have released this vehicle. This is the Recreational Activity Vehicle Four-Wheel Drive, or in plain English, the RAV4. The traditional sport utility has either become too big or, as is probably closer to the truth, too expensive for many consumers. And so the RAV4 gives Toyota access to a completely new segment of the marketplace, i.e. the one below that of the 4Runner, meaning more affordable. Read the press kit and it says that the RAV4 is new from the ground up. However, look at the specifications and they suggest that the late Celica all-wheel drive has been reincarnated sans turbo. Is this a bad thing? Not at all if you believe in using proven technology. The engine size at 2 litres is the same as the Celica, although it lacks a few of the ponies. Power is rated 120 horses at 5400 RPM, while torque comes in at 4600 and tips the scales at a respectable 125 pounds-feet. Given the relative light weight of the RAV, this level of power gives the vehicle a crisp feel. Ring the engine out to the red line in each of the five manual gears and you attain highway speed in short order. The drivetrain format and the all-wheel drive system likewise have their similarities to Celica. In manual form, the all-wheel drive system requires the driver to manually lock the center differential as and when the need arises. This is the only advantage the slush o -matic enjoys over its manual sibling, and that is that the center differential is automatically locked when it needs to be. That aside, the automatic transmission gives the RAV4 a lethargic feel, particularly if you venture off-road. The fact that it lacks a two-speed transfer case compounds the situation. So as I'm apt to say a lot, stick with the stick. The gearbox is user-friendly, the throws are short, the gate well-defined, and the clutch light and progressive. The instrument panel on the RAV4 is the model of simplicity. It's also the model of efficiency because everything, and I mean everything, right down to the rear window defroster, can be reached and accessed with ease. The other thing, even though the radio sits low down in the dash and below the climate controls, which is a usual source of aggravation for me, it is high enough that you can see it relying upon peripheral vision. Usually compact cars mean compromised rear seat room. Well, that's not the case for the RAV4. With the chair set for me, there's an abundance of knee room, there's plenty of room underneath the seat, so you've got toe room, and as for headroom, well, there's acres. And given the external dimensions, the trunk is actually quite roomy, and when you factor in the 60-40 split folding rear seats, you have the required versatility. The suspension features McPherson struts, coil springs, and a sway bar up front, while the rear utilizes a fully independent double wishbone design with trailing arms. The ride comfort is surprisingly good for a small vehicle. It is completely devoid of any truck-like feeling, and at speed, there is little of the seesaw motion so common in these downsized sport utes. Stopping power comes from a disc drum setup that is offered with optional ABS. Toyota missed the boat on this one because this important safety feature should be standard on any vehicle in this price class. That aside, the stops are short, the pedal is easily modulated, and the ABS only comes into play when absolutely necessary. On the safety front, the RAV4 comes with all the usual stuff, including dual airbags, childproof rear door locks, and available ABS. Usually a combination of rear seat headrests and a spare tire that's mounted on the tailgate equates to a disastrous view through the rear view mirror. Well, that's not the case on the RAV4, primarily because the headrests are small enough and the spare tire barely sticks up above the window line. Well, that's it for yet another test drive. You know, the RAV4 is gonna sell very well. Maybe not for what it is, but certainly because of who makes it. One thing is very sure and very clear. 
It's going to give the Suzuki one heck of a sidekick. It's time to introduce you to our three new long-term testers. First up, we have the totally new Hyundai Elantra. This car was brought into the fleet to see if Hyundai are serious about their commitment to long-term quality. Next up, we have the Mazda 626 Kronos. We selected this car because it represents an affordable alternative to Camry or Accord. Is it really as good or is it just a pretender? The Pathfinder was the first car ever tested on motoring. Since that fateful day, more than 220 cars have been under the microscope. We'll try to find out why the sport utility market is so big and looks as though it's going to sustain this growth. It is a 1964 Corvair Monza 110. Brown interior, saddle interior, convertible. I picked it up in approximately 15 years ago and it taken me approximately 11 years to disassemble and reassemble. And the last year was the first year I had it on the road. The Corvair delivers the goods as no other compact car can. The spare tire is covering the carburetor. It's dual single throat carburetors. As you can see, this spare tire covers one. And that rubber never gets that hot? or No, air-cooled engine never gets that hot. As an owner, as a driver, the engine in the back, the spare tire, what do you think of it? Was it really a problem? No problems. All the time that I've had it, but I haven't put that many miles on it, and I love driving it. It's usually a Sunday driver. If General Motors wishes to know why I spent an inordinate amount of time on the Corvair, it is because the Corvair is an inordinately dangerous vehicle. Ralph Nader said it was unsafe at any speed. What do you think of that? Well, I put a few miles on it and I haven't had any problems. <laughs> I don't know if Ralph has or not. <laughs> Our Midas tip of the week concerns dealing with a bulky hood release. Most of today's cars and light trucks have an inside hood release. And at least once a day I run into one that won't properly release when you pull the release mechanism inside the vehicle. Don't overdo it. If you force the issue, you're likely to break the cable or damage that mechanism. Ideally, you should have an assistant go to the front of the vehicle and while you pull the release inside the vehicle, have that assistant give the hood a smack right above the release mechanism. That'll usually do the trick. If you don't have the luxury of an assistant, reach out with your other hand, give the hood a smack, and that'll usually release it. Now the fix isn't difficult either. If you come around to the front of the vehicle and open the hood, you can see the safety catch and the spring that's supposed to pop the hood up that initial inch or so when you pull the release mechanism. Over here we've got the catch mechanism and the release cable right here. And if you spray this entire business with a uh, penetrating lubricant and spray, you'll likely free it up such that it'll work properly. Once again, don't overdo things. When you're smacking the hood, go right on a feature line and take it easy because if you overdo it, you can actually dent the hood on some of today's vehicles. And you can see a couple of wrinkles in this one. So just take it easy and you'll get her fixed. That's your Midas tip of the week. A portion of Motoring 97 is brought to you by the Solder Seal Gunk family of automotive products, makers of Puncture Seal Gold and Liquid Wrench. Manufacturers have been conducting crash tests almost since the birth of the automobile. Not only have the cars become more sophisticated, but so have the test dummies. Well, that's probably the toughest part of the job of, of designing a crash dummy is how do you know what a human would, would behave like in something like a, a crash test. Um, obviously, we cannot put real humans in there and, and get that data. So the data has come from a variety of sources. Uh, there have been many experiments on, on animals. There's been uh, anesthetized uh, pigs and monkeys that have been tested. Uh, the pig's chest is very similar to that of a human, so a lot of research has been done on that. Uh, there also has been a lot of testing done on cadavers, where they would, for example, inflate the lungs with air and then impact the chest, and have lots of instrumentation very similar to what we've seen on the dummies. Uh, some of the other data 
which is at the other end of the spectrum from the cadavers, um, a lot of the research done in, in the, the Air Force and the Navy, they, use, they do use live subjects where you've got the, the healthiest 19 and 20 year olds in, in the world where they put them on sleds and accelerate them and uh, they use what they call the ouch endpoint. They, they would take them to the limit of, of when they said ouch. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've seen any data from testing done in the United States on cadavers. Uh, but I, I, can, I can tell you some people that would gladly accept your body if you'd be willing to donate it to them for, for research. If you think it's a challenge choosing a name for your new child, think about car companies. I mean, every few years or so, they've got to come out with a new name for a brand new vehicle, and they can't use Junior. Well, some car companies name their vehicles after cities like Malibu, the Monte Carlo, the New Yorker, and so on. Well, Hyundai has named a Tiburon after this town, Tiburon, California. Now, if you happen to live here in Tiburon, check out your view, the city of San Francisco. But you know what they say, with every view comes a price. Now, check out these condos over here. A real estate agent told me that 10 years ago, they sold for $85,000. The latest offers, $850,000. I wonder if Bill Gardner's got a place here. Not a chance, Brad. You won't find a mechanic in the place, but I'll tell you, bring me back some addresses and a map for that place because uh, I want to go down there. I got it figured that anybody that can afford $850,000 for a condo could probably afford to have an on-staff mechanic, their own personal mechanic. You know, I could be a uh, mechanic to the movie stars, bring the Porsche around, Bill, tune her up and meet me at the country club, that kind of thing. Any case, what I want to talk about this week is... Uh, solutions to problems that many motorists have encountered and that's when you take your car or light truck in for a wheel alignment and you've got a tire wear or handling problem with that vehicle some of the the uh, angles may be out of spec but in many cases on a lot of cars and light trucks today the provision for moving or adjusting some of those angles may not be built in from the factory so you may have to take some special measures may involve some different parts or some uh, novel ideas in order to build the adjustability back into these cars and light trucks to get rid of your tire wear and handling problems that's exactly what we're going to do today normally when you take your vehicle in for a wheel alignment caster camber and tow are checked and adjusted if they're out of spec however there's quite a few of today's cars and light trucks where caster and camber, if they're out of spec, may not be readily adjustable. My 88 GMC pickup is a vehicle with just such a problem. When I checked the wheel alignment, the camber was found to be out a cotton pick and mile. Way too positive. It was wearing the heck out of the outside of the front tire on one side, and it had a pretty severe steering pull as well. We want to get rid of that situation because it's quite bothersome and it would wear the new tires when they go on as well. What we're going to do today is install a simple little cam kit that's going to give us back the provision to readily adjust caster and camber on this particular vehicle. Here's the anchoring point for the upper control arm in this particular vehicle. But you can see that there's a washer welded right there, so the adjustment is fixed. It can't be moved. What we've got to do is get that bolt and nut out of there, and then we're going to chisel that washer off, and you're going to see an elongated slot in this uh, frame bracket right here. Then once we install the cam uh, where the stock nut and bolt came out, it's going to give us some adjustability. When we turn the cam, it's going to move the center line of this shaft inboard or outboard in order to give us our adjustment. Okay, we've installed the cam kit in the front of this upper control arm. We're going to have to go to the back of the same control arm, chisel out that uh, welded washer and install uh, the other cam in the back of this one. There's two per side on this vehicle. Now, once they're installed, here's the action that takes place. When we turn the head of this bolt now, remember that that, uh, that eccentric washer was keyed to the bolt shaft, and it's going to move our whole control arm inboard or outboard. That's going to give us the ability to uh, change the camber if we move both of them simultaneously inboard or outboard, or if we move them alternately of each other, we can change caster as well, or any combination thereof but you can see the action that's involved. That control arm moves quite readily in a quite wide range of adjustment. Now the installation of this cam kit that we showed you here today is about an hour to an hour and a half proposition on this particular vehicle and about $30 on the parts side. Now if you're about to take your vehicle in for a wheel alignment, you may want to discuss beforehand with the technicians who are going to do the job if your particular vehicle is fully adjustable in all areas because if it's not and you've, you encounter a problem, if your, your vehicle is not to spec, this is the kind of midstream correction you need to make. Now 
If the technician takes the readings and the vehicle is already to spec and non-adjustable, you leave well enough alone. Obviously, you don't have to disturb it, but in many cases, they weren't, and they may not have been to spec for quite some time. That may have been the cause of your tire wear problems and an ongoing handling problem. If you remedy those situations, along with putting on new tires, you're gonna have a much better handling and performing vehicle. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 97. What do wild geese, bicycle helmets, and idling engines have in common? Find out next on Kenzie Fun. They used to call this Toronto the Good. The only violence you'd see here would be two Torontonians fighting over who was going to throw the last scrap of trash in the garbage bin. Now, part of this reputation stems from the endless regulation that affects this town. We got stoop and scoop bylaws for dogs in the park, we got no shopping on Sunday, and bars close at 1 o'clock, and the latest don't feed the wild geese, mandatory bike helmets for kids, and no unnecessary idling of your engine. Now, you might expect me to rant and rave against this mindless intrusion on in our personal lives. Well, I'm not sure about the geese, but I don't see why any kid should be turned into a vegetable just because he falls off his bike. Now, I don't expect cops to run eight-year-olds, but maybe this law will give the wimpy parents a bit of a lever to force their kids to do the right thing. And as for the engine idlers, I say hit them right between the exhaust pipes. Now, again, I don't expect Toronto's finest to be sitting there with stopwatches and clicking these guys at one second over the limit. But maybe the law will focus people's attention on how stupid it is to idle your car. I mean, first of all, you're getting zero miles per gallon. Mercedes-Benz has shown that you can turn an engine on and off 30 times in a minute and still use less fuel than if it idles for that length of time. Now, some truckers say they've got to leave their engine running because it's too hard to start after the coffee break. Well, they're full of it. I've got a diesel engine. It'll start easily after an hour or two. And if it's going to be stopped for longer than that, there are auxiliary heaters which do the job much more efficiently. An idling engine also is damaging to itself. Now, you might say that wasting fuel and damaging the engine only affects the guy who owns the vehicle, and that's true. It's the third angle, the pollution angle, that affects all of us. I mean, car makers have spent billions over the last couple of decades making our engines as pollution-free as possible, and now so many people sit there and throw it all away by leaving their engines running for hours at, at, on end. So I ask you, please, for you guys, even you car drivers, if you're waiting for your friend at the office or at the airport or waiting at a level crossing, do not only Toronto the good a favor, but Canada the clean. Please shut them down. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, Hyundai said that its research showed that people who purchase a sporty car like this Tiburon are looking for a vehicle that's fun to drive and also one that they'll be seen and noticed in. Well, it definitely is fun to drive and it even turned heads, which is saying something here in California. Now, Graham Fletcher will be taking a closer look at the Tiburon on a future program on Test Drive but I think you'll agree with my first impressions, Hyundai have a winner. And remember the pony? Something Hyundai I'm sure would like to forget? Well, maybe like the wine that these grapes in the Sonoma Valley are about to produce, maybe Hyundai is getting better with age. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Um, our own views within the company were very clear. We wanted a, a spiritual successor to the E-Type. The market research that we carried out confirmed that, no surprises there, so it was fairly straightforward to uh, select a theme that honoured the spirit of uh, Jaguar's sports cars from the 1960s. In the late 50s we have the jet age beginning. Boeing 707s are coming out and they're starting to fly and it's really captured the public imagination. So the car companies aren't, aren't stupid and so they picked up on jet styling themes for automobiles. TSN's Motoring 97 has been brought to you by Quaker State. The Big Q stands for quality, always has, always will, and Midas, the way it should be.